So can I, can I just ask, how many of you recognize the cultural reference of, do you want to take the blue pill or the red pill? Okay. No? Yeah. Yes. It's from the Matrix. It's from the Matrix. And, um, and the Matrix is a dystopian world. Well, actually, it's a very nice world. It's a world in which everybody seems to live, and it's a world that we live in. But actually, it's, it's several hundred years in the future when there's been a big war, and the, the world is actually totally devastated, and the machines have taken over. And human beings are, are actually in pods and their, elect, their body electricity is being harvested to drive the machines. But to keep them, keep them doing this, the machines create this world which is an illusion, right? And everyone thinks they're having a wonderful time or not, but they think that the, the real world, what they think of as the real world is not it, it at all. And it's, it's, it's an illusion. And um, Lawrence Fishburne uh, says to, to, to plays this character Morpheus. Morpheus as in to do with sleep. He's waking the sleeper who is Keanu Reeves, Neo. And he says, you can have a blue pill or a red pill. If you take the blue pill, you go back to sleep and it's as though nothing has happened. But if you take the red pill, it opens up it's going to blow your mind. He said, I will show you just how deep the rabbit hole really goes. And when we come to the question of Jesus and money, it's a bit like taking the red pill. It's a bit like taking the red pill for us because when Jesus talks about money, he's talking about us. He's talking about wealthy people. And if you want to say to yourself, but I'm not particularly wealthy, Jesus' point of comparison between the rich and the poor is are you somebody who does not know where your next piece of daily bread is coming from? Then you are poor and anyone else is in a much better place and you're wealthier. And that's, I just want to, to, to flag that. So he's talking to us and what he says is really, really uncomfortable. I have no idea what the answers of what we are exactly supposed to do as followers of Jesus. But you'll, you'll know as you've read this, he said to, to, he makes wealth an issue of discipleship. You cannot be my disciple and be wealthy, he says. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And that is very difficult for the church. And, and we sleep through this stuff, like the people in the Matrix. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. Can you remember Sunday when we went to St. George's Chapel? What was the point of the parable that Jesus told? What was the punchline? Because in the, punch line, in the parables, there's always a punchline that tells you exactly what the point that Jesus is trying to make. Oh, in the Bible? Yes. Yes. And his final point is because you cannot serve God and mammon, you cannot serve both God and wealth. And we had a sermon that had nothing to do with that. It became a sermon about living out our baptismal stuff and, and mission and everything. And we all go, yeah, yeah, that's great. And it is great. We'll ring those bells. But the issue of wealth wasn't there. And then the dean stood up and said, if any of you feel moved to, f to fund a series of windows in the cathedral, please do so. And, and nothing jarred, did it? <laughs> and I'm, I'm not trying to have a go at Sir Hale or the dean or, or the cathedral. I'm just trying to say this is how it works. Actually, we live very, very comfortably with issues of money. And Jesus is very uncomfortable with issues of money. I, I, I said to you that, that whatever we say about Jesus has got to answer the question, the story we tell, how do, why does it end up on a Roman cross? Why does he get crucified as a Roman terrorist? 
trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. The question that we've got to ask about money is this. Why is it that next to the kingdom of God, Jesus speaks about money more than any other subject? How many of you find that surprising? You all knew that. You're all aware of that. If somebody said to you, you know what Jesus talked a lot about? You'd go, money. Yeah. How many sermons do you hear about money? How many sermons have you preached about money? And, and given that Jesus is overwhelmingly, unremittingly negative about money, how uncomfortable are you at night? And I'm speaking to myself, this is not a sermon, right? I'm saying this is disturbing stuff. It puts me in a place where the gospel sounds, sounds difficult. Because what Jesus, what Jesus, Jesus does not talk about money. Now we all go, money's neutral. It's the love of money that's bad. It's the way that we use money is bad. And Jesus seems to think that money itself is a problem. He certainly talks about wealth. And the word he uses is mammon. Mammon. And there are two things about mammon. Number one, it is a god. Where are your treasures, says Jesus? Where is your heart? You cannot serve God and mammon. Money becomes a god. Secondly, it's addictive. It's addictive. It'll, in the words of Bruce Springsteen, it'll take your God-filled soul and fill it with devils and dust. Money has the power to destroy like nothing else. Judas sells Jesus out. We're selling the planet out because of money because we want to enjoy our lifestyle. We live at the expense of others because it's comfortable. I mean, which of us is going to say, oh, you know what, Brian, I'm really sorry that you, you booked us into this wonderful place and that we've got, well, there are times when we don't want air conditioning, but you know, we've got air conditioning, we've got a swimming pool, we've got incredible food. You know, who's gonna say, no, I don't want that, I'm not voting for that. We, we do, we, we love it and we need it. But what does Jesus say? He says, he says, guys, this is like trying to say, of course, money isn't a problem. It's, it's how you use it. It's like saying crack cocaine is not a problem. It's just how you use it. And actually, of course, we can use it for good because we're the church. It, now, whether you agree or not with Jesus, that is what he says about it. That's how he treats money. Because because he says this, he says, you can't be my disciple and be wealthy. Why not? Because the kingdom, you cannot deliver the kingdom of God through money. In Jesus' world, he was brought up as a good Jew. A good Jew will tell you the world is divided into two, at, at, the, at the very heart of creation, there's a, binary, there's a binary opposition. Jews and Gentiles. That's, that's the fundamental division in the world. And, and the stuff that God does in, in, in a lot of Jewish theology that the prophets get very upset about is, is that that becomes an exclusive thing. You know, God loves us and God doesn't love the other people. God is going to give us everything and we're going to live wonderfully and wealth and sheep and all these things are a sign of God's blessing. And then the other people, if they're in trouble, it's because, or even among the Jewish community, if you haven't got enough, etc., etc., that kind of suffering is because God is withholding God's blessing from you. Yeah, I mean, we've seen it. It's in the scriptures that that is how people view wealth. Jesus wants to say this. He wants to say there's actually an even funda more fundamental uh, rupture 
in, 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 in human society. It's not just Jews and Gentiles, because if you look at Jewish society, that breaks down even further into the people who have got nothing and who are always on the bottom of the pile and those Jews who will exploit their own fellow Israelites. Do, do you see Jesus' point? In other words, it's always the few, or even if it's a lot, it's not everyone that benefits. And Jesus' Luke's announcement, and Luke is the one, Luke is the Gospel writer, who talks about Jesus and money more than anybody else. Luke's angelic announcement at the beginning, remember? I will bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people, all people. So how do you get a society in which all people benefit, not that you live at the expense of others? And, and Jesus is talking contextually, all right, he is talking in the context of the Roman occupation. And he, he basically operates on the premise that um, there is enough to go around, but that if some people have more than they need, necessarily others have less than they need. And Jesus' problem with wealth is that the only way that you can increase your wealth under occupation, if you're Jewish, is by exploitation. Typical exploitation, Carissa's household economy is going belly up. She just simply cannot afford to keep going. So she puts her family land up for sale, a little bit of her family land. And I'm out for a bargain and I think to myself, she's in real trouble. I'm going to, I'm going to use this to increase my land holdings and get it at a real knockdown bargain price. That's exploitation. So when Jesus is faced with a rich young ruler who says, I've kept all the commandments, Jesus is going, okay. So, so what you've got to do now, the one thing that you still have to do is you've got to get out of the system of living at the expense of your neighbors. So sell everything you've got and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And he turns around and he walks away because he's very rich. And Jesus, Jesus says, you, a rich man can't get into heaven or a rich person can't get into heaven. The disciples say, well, that's impossible. You know, that's impossible. Who then can be saved? And Jesus said, things are impossible with humans but with God all things are possible so what have we done with that what we've done as a church particularly <coughs> since 313 and particularly as wealthy churches we have said well it's okay because with God everything's possible so God simply got to do some bit of divine magic and, and we, we get let in even though Jesus said it's impossible for us to, to get in. That's not what Jesus means. And that's why we've got the story of Zacchaeus which follows, as you'll see, very closely on, on the story of the rich person. What Luke is doing is telling us the story of Jesus so that we begin to understand how Jesus expects this problem to be sorted out. That's what Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus, represents. Because what does Zacchaeus do? He's a man who has been a tax collector. I mean, you know, he's been collecting the occupation tax. Uh, he's not popular. In the camps, Auschwitz, Birkenau, Theresian stuff, all those camps, what the Germans would do would be to ask for volunteers among the Jews to act as capos. They were the camp police and they worked for the Germans in return for an extended life. 
and they were some of the most brutal. They were more brutal than some of the SS guards because they'd been co-opted by the system and they did it to survive. That's the tax collector in the time of Jesus. And the tax collectors did it because they could not only survive but they could thrive. They could, they could increase their wealth and income. And the moment that Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, let me come and eat with you, it's not, I'm feeling a bit peckish, have you got a sandwich for me? He's saying to Zacchaeus, this up, utter outcast, Zacchaeus, I want to eat with you. I want to share fellowship with you. I want to be your friend. I want to be your companion, because the word companion literally means you know, companion, a bread sharer, bread sharer, a bed, bread breaker together. These are companions. I will be your companion. And that's a converting moment for Zacchaeus because, because he's accepted. And what's his response? Lord, I'm going to repay everybody what I've stolen from them. And actually, I'm not only going to give them back what I've taken from them, I'm going to give them extra to make reparation for what I've done. And Jesus said, truly, this, this is the son of Abraham. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is how wealth, wealthy people need to behave. Because, because we've talked about it before. How do you mend or create a society which is divided? It's not just an issue of Jews and Gentiles. It's about within the, the Jewish community itself. What about that? The people who always uh, get um, to benefit are the rich and the powerful. The people who never get to benefit are the poor and the dispossessed. And Jesus said it's always that way. You know, who, to whomever has, more and more will be given. And to, ever have, to whomever has not, even what they have will be taken away from them. How does reconciliation, this mending that Jesus is doing, and Paul, you remember, Paul in, in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, talks about Christian ministry. I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about word and sacraments. The ministry the mission of the church, he talks about as reconciliation. The body of Christ is, the church as the body of Christ is here to bring reconciliation and healing. How does that happen? It's concrete. It's absolutely concrete in the Bible. It, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not just, oh I'm sorry I've been so mean to you. Let's sit down and have a meal together. First of all, there's remorse needed. There are lots of R's. There's remorse. I'm sorry. I see what I have done. And the one thing about money, says Jesus, is it kills compassion. That's Dives and Lazarus. You know, you've got to imagine, well, I don't know about you, but I imagine the rich man lives in this sumptuous castle with a big wall around it. And the wall protects him from seeing the poverty and the suffering and everything else. He shuts himself off from that and there's poor Lazarus at the gate. It kills compassion. So there needs to be remorse. Secondly, there needs to be repentance. Repentance is not the same thing as remorse. It's not being sorry. It's actually saying, okay, I am going to live differently from now on. I'm going to turn my back on the old way. Thirdly, you need to make repayment. If you've exploited someone, you need to pay them back. Give them what you've taken. And fourthly, there's reparation. It's not just that you've taken something from somebody, but they've suffered because of it. For all the time that you've had it. You know, I don't know, but it's, it's, like, it's like I get an electricity bill. And they tell me that I'm 200 quid in credit. But not to worry, it'll all, you know, by the end of the year it'll all be fine. So what's happening? 
they're sitting with my money in their account making money for all the time that you know I haven't got it and I say to them please could I have it in my account that, that's reparation and only when all those other things have been done is, is, is reconciliation possible why? because now between us we've created a new way of relating and a new world order and here's the last thought have you noticed how just about all the images that we the, the terms for salvation that we use are economic terms redemption is buying back sin in the Lord's Prayer Jesus teaches us he doesn't say forgive us our trespasses as though it was the naughty things we have done we've translated it as trespasses actually what he says is forgive us our debts forgive us our debts debt is a financial a, a financial term sin is financial um, what other ones have we got guilt 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 health gold it's the things that we have that we ought not to have um, salvation, salvation. Salary. 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 The, the, they're, they're financial terms. Why? Because at the heart, the way in which sin works is, is through the ways in which we, we, um, we treat each other financially. Money, it is the economy. You know, somebody said it's the economy stupid. It is the economy. Everything boils down to economic things. That doesn't mean it's only the economy, but it's never less than the economy. And the economy has an effect on the way in which we relate to each other. It has an effect on our hearts. It has an effect on our spirituality. And it has an, an effect on the way in which we perpetuate all these things.